All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction, Judge. Um, okay, so before we get started, um, I want to make just a few disclaimers. We're going to go through a little bit of information today. First of all, we're going to look at Supreme Court activity related to American Indian law cases. We'll look at some circuit court activity as well, and then end up just briefly discussing um, what's going on in the district courts um, related to Indian law. Um, but I, I do have to, in the interest of full disclosure, um, let you know that I was actually asked by Judge Bigler not to spend a whole lot of time on Carpenter versus Murphy, and there's a good reason for that. Number one, he knows he'd have to get the hook and try to get me off the stage because I could talk about that for hours and hours and hours. But the real reason is because you're going to have someone much more qualified and much more interesting to listen to about that case in particular on tomorrow's agenda. So, Judge, you're going to see a slide here that says Carpenter versus Murphy, but I want you to know I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm just going to talk about it just very, very briefly because you can't talk about the Supreme Court update um, right now without talking about that case, which is currently pending. So. Um, before we before we talk um, specifically about cases um, at the Supreme Court dealing with American Indian law, I want us to talk through kind of some recent transitions on that court that may have a big impact in the way that cases are decided that affect um, American Indian populations in the United States. So uh, back when we had Scalia on the court, right, we were kind of dealing with this five-four split five in kind of the anti-tribal sovereignty, anti-tribal jurisdiction camp, and then four in kind of a more pro-tribal stance um, on the court. So I'm gonna use my hands for a little bit. I'm sorry if that gets distracting. So when we think about that 5-4 split, it's not every single case, right? There were some cases that were Indian law cases where the Supreme Court would come out with unanimous opinion in favor of a tribe. One that I can think of off the top of my head is Cherokee Nation's contract support cost case, which was back in about 2005. We did have um, instances where that 5-4 split wasn't present in the decisions. But as Indian law practitioners, we kind of have recognized that there's this weird kind of 5-4 split um, with, this, with Scalia on the court that was impacting the way that uh, decisions affected American Indian tribes in the United States, right? So what happens is uh, Scalia passes away, is no longer on the court. So we're left with this kind of 4-4 situation. And when uh, the president nominated the replacement for Scalia, those of us who practice in Oklahoma, those of us who follow American Indian law in Oklahoma, were uh, pleased from an Indian law perspective with the nominee because it is a person who has served on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, Neil Gorsuch, right? So when Gorsuch is nominated, those of us who don't have anything better to do than sit around and read tea leaves about the Supreme Court, um, we start thinking that maybe that 5-4 split when Scalia was there changes to maybe a 5-4 split in the other direction with Gorsuch, right? That's what we were, you know, thinking and maybe hoping for. And I'll tell you, it's not just, you know, based on crazy conversations that we have with each other in the halls of conferences. Um, Turtle Talk, I don't know how many of you have Turtle Talk on your Facebook or um, are subscribed to their email list. But Turtle Talk actually did some analysis of Neil Gorsuch's Indian law opinions and found that in over 90% of cases, he cited in favor of the exercise of tribal jurisdiction, right? So we have this um, good um, nominee to replace someone on the court who had been kind of on the other side of the Indian law uh, decisions. And this individual, Neil Gorsuch, has experience in Indian law coming from the Tenth Circuit, which handles a whole lot of Indian law opinions, and also had a good record, according to some statistical analysis that had been done. So um, we had that shift and that change, and are you know kind of waiting to see how that plays out and how much of an impact Gorsuch being on the court is going to have in the realm of Indian law. Um, you guys will also recall that. Um, Justice Kennedy um, retired and that uh, he was replaced by Justice Kavanaugh. Um, I'll tell you that uh, there, there's not a lot of change in that particular vote expectation, right? It doesn't seem that um, Justice Kavanaugh is going to uh, be a pro-Indian uh, law voter. Um, he's not going to change what Kennedy's vote otherwise would be on Indian law cases. It appears, it appears, who knows, right? We haven't seen enough of them just yet. Okay, so when we talk about Carpenter versus Murphy, um, and we talk about that in the context of what I've just kind of laid out for you. Keep in mind, in Carpenter versus Murphy, Neil Gorsuch is not participating in the case. And the reason for that is he was on the Tenth Circuit, 
when the initial uh, motions were being filed on the Carpenter case. He didn't hear them, he didn't participate in them, but as, uh, as is appropriate from, uh, from a judicial ethics perspective, he has recused participating in the Carpenter versus Murphy decision. Um, and again, you're gonna hear about that a whole lot more um, tomorrow. I do want, however, to talk about a few things that you might do if you haven't studied this case or haven't kept up with this case. Um, some things that you might think about doing when you go back to your hotel room tonight, just to prepare for the discussion that you're gonna have tomorrow that'll be a little bit more of a robust um, discussion. So obviously, you can always start off by reading just those initial filings at the Supreme Court, you know, the petition for cert and also the response brief that was filed uh, by Mr. Murphy, but this is, this is something I really think is really cool, okay? So um, when, I, when I teach American Indian law to my law students, I'm always telling them to look at the Supreme Court activity to get kind of a feel for how policy arguments and how perspectives can kind of shape the way that a court views a particular legal issue. So one really interesting place to look when you're trying to dip, do that deeper dive and understand kind of what the fundamental arguments are from both sides behind this, this litigation, it's really helpful to take a look at who all has filed amicus briefs, right? So what we have here um, on this slide is a list of uh, groups and organizations who have filed amicus briefs um, basically arguing against recognition of Creek Nation's reservation status, okay? So if you take a look, um, if you take a look at the different types of groups that we're looking at there, we're looking at Environmental Federation, we're looking at Farm Bureaus, um, we're looking at Petroleum Associations. Um, the second slide also includes additional folks um, who would argue against recognition of Creek Nation's reservation status. Um, again, you can go through and read every single one of these briefs. You can totally do that if you want to. Um, I don't recommend it because you might get very angry, right? You might get very angry when you read through all these because the arguments that they make are just not founded in any kind of law. They're not, right? If I had to summarize the arguments, pretty much the arguments are, wham, if this happens, it's going to be really bad and really hard and we're all going to be sad about it, right? I mean, honestly, if you go through and read all of these amicus briefs, <clears throat> you're going to notice that a whole lot of the narrative that's built up around them is about how the sky is falling, right? The sky is falling as it relates to tribal exercise of jurisdiction. And those of you who you know, practice in Syria work in this field, you read those types of arguments and you think that is just not true, right? The sky is not falling. Everything they're kind of throwing up against the wall to see if it's gonna stick shouldn't stick if analyzed properly. Um, so it's a frustrating exercise, but nonetheless worthwhile to go through just to kind of see what um, those arguments are and those policy discussions are that are kind of formulating the narrative around this. I'll tell you, um, if you go through all of them, you're gonna find some common ties among them. Number one, a lot of these briefs talk about um, concerns related to environmental regulation. A lot of these briefs talk about concerns about oil and gas development inside of Indian country in Oklahoma. Um, there's also, I saw this on the news, you guys, I gotta stop getting my news off of Facebook, but I saw this on the news, on, on Facebook, right? There was this article that said, this Supreme Court case could result in tribes in Oklahoma owning all of the state of Oklahoma, right? And I see that article and I'm like, cool, that sounds like fun to me. But in reality, you know, it's kind of a scare tactic, it's kind of one of those, the sky is falling arguments. And it's gotten people driven up about something that in reality, if you have any kind of you know, legal analytical skills, you can quickly um, parse through exactly what impact um, the, the holding is likely to have. Um, it won't have any impact on private ownership in the state of Oklahoma. People own land or still going to own land, right? Um, but you know, there are definitely some other, um, some other aspects to think through in a more reasonable way. Um, here are a list of your amicus briefs that were filed in support of recognition of Creek Nation's reservation status. There was this one big brief, kind of a monster brief, Oklahoma elected officials brief, and you had people like uh, David Boren, um, Brad Henry, Tom Cole, Neil McCaleb, um, a lot of the elected officials from Oklahoma who are either tribal member that, members themselves or who have worked with tribes during their careers, um, signing on to a brief to say, hey, everybody, get your heads calmed down. Um, the sky is not falling and we need to look at this um, through a different lens. Um, the second slide has additional amicus briefs that were filed by organizations um, in support of recognition of Creek Nation's reservation status. 
Um, I'll tell you that um, each of these briefs has a little bit different flavor to it, unlike kind of the first two slides we talked about on the amicus issue. Um, these all look at some look at um, exercise of tribal jurisdiction through a particular lens. Um, and really do a good job of fleshing out um, what the narrative should be as it relates to this discussion. Um, and here are just a couple more um, that are listed on this next slide. I'll tell you that the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center filed a very nice brief related to exercise of uh, criminal jurisdiction over individuals who, per who perpetrate violence against Native women, and our very own Oklahoma Indian Legal Services signed on to that brief as well. So they're definitely worth checking out. I don't want to sign homework for tonight, but you might think about take a look at this stuff just so you can engage with the presenter tomorrow in a more meaningful way. Um, a couple of things that I'll tell you, if you don't have time to go look at all the filings, you don't want to read all the briefs, I totally get that. It is worth going and looking at the oral argument transcript. Um, you can actually look at the transcript itself or you can pull up the audio, which is even better, right? You can pull up the audio of the oral arguments that were presented in front of the Supreme Court. If you have some time tonight, I recommend that you do that before tomorrow's session on this case. Um, as practitioners, you know, we're taught the Supreme Court is kind of this um, important place where people need to be on their best behavior and be as professional and as polished as possible. And there are some inter interactions, some exchanges between um, counsel, who, you know, obviously is opposing recognition of Creek Nation's reservation status, and the bench that just completely floored me. I'm going to use it as a what not to do when I teach um, Indian law next semester. So I definitely recommend um, looking at that transcript if you can um, listen to the oral argument because it'll tell you a whole lot about um, how that's going. Importantly, it also will um, maybe give you some idea as to how the individuals on the bench are leaning insofar as their vote is concerned, right? You can kind of tell based on questions that are asked and the tone of voice when a question is asked which way a particular justice is leaning in his or her thinking about the legal issues that are presented. So it's a really cool exercise. Um, I recommend that you do that this evening if you get a chance, because tomorrow you're going to have a Carpenter versus Murphy discussion, and it would be great to be able to engage at, at a higher level. Another um, pending case that has been argued in front of the Supreme Court, not yet decided, but argued, is Herrera versus Wyoming. Um, this is a case where we have all nine justices participating. Okay, so um, we'll get we'll get back to that here in just a second, but everybody's participating in this one. So um, oral arguments have already been held, waiting on a decision. Basically, in this case, uh, the Treaty of 1868 um, secured in the Crow tribe the right to hunt on unoccupied lands of the United States. A Crow member did engage in hunting. It was subsistence hunting, and it was on off-reservation lands that were part of that initial treaty territory that was set forth. Um, the Wyoming Supreme Court determined that the treaty right did not still stand, and the issue that the court has to decide is whether Wyoming becoming a state or the establishment of the National Forest abrogated um, the Crow Tribe's treaty right. Again, I do think it's helpful to go back and look at who is sounding off on this from an amicus brief perspective. Here we have a list of individuals who are filing in favor of treaty rights, recognition of these treaty rights. Indian law professors, tribes themselves, um, practitioners, not just um, legal practitioners, but also anthropologists, historians, um, folks who work in the public health space, right? Sounding off about um, the issues that, that would be impacted if treaty rights weren't recognized in this instance. Um, on, the next, on the next slide, we have a list of, again, um, organizations and groups that would argue against these treaty rights being recognized. These are folks who are kind of favoring abrogation of those treaty rights. And you can just look down the list and kind of understand uh, policy-wise where they're coming from, right? We're talking about those entities that regulate and uh, make money off of the regulation of fish and wildlife. Um, and, and you've got a whole lot of states that just signed on to one big kind of monster brief there as well. So again, on this case, I encourage you, if you want to, to check it out, because you can just get on this little website right here and get everything you want. You can pull everything up for free. You can listen to the audio. You can read the transcript. It's really, really cool that we can do that on the internet now. Um, but I want to point one thing out to you about the oral argument, because the transcript was pretty impressive, OK? As soon as counsel arguing on behalf of recognition of treaty rights, as soon as this lawyer gets up and starts engaging with the bench, Justice Alito, like, just tackles the person and starts asking questions that have nothing to do at all with federal Indian law. The questions Justice Alito were at, was asking 
The questions um, were really related to preclusion doctrine under state law. And honestly, if you're thinking about you know doing oral arguments, just like in law school, we used to do oral arguments, and they time you and stuff, right? Like Judge Bigler's about to start timing me. Um, they, they time you, and you have a short amount of time. The Justice Alito's exchange with this attorney took so long, and it just ate into how this attorney was trying to present a case that was related to treaty rights, but getting kind of pulled off and veered off into talking about preclusion doctrine, which nobody wants to talk about ever. So what's interesting about this exchange is, at some point, Neil Gorsuch just interrupts and says, I don't want to talk about preclusion anymore. I don't, I don't know why we're even talking about this. Let's talk about the merits of the case based on treaty rights, right? So from that point on, Justice Alito didn't ask any more questions about that preclusion thing, which was just kind of a red herring, and um, the attorney was able to go ahead and complete the argument and uh, you know finish up talking about treaty rights. So again, I'm probably reading way too much into this, and I'm probably like, I feel like Neil Gorsuch is Obi-Wan Kenobi to me right now, like he may be our only hope, but I'm really hopeful that this indicates, right, a leaning towards recognition of, of tribal sovereignty and support for the exercise of tribal jurisdiction. I've got my fingers crossed. We'll see when the opinion comes out. Um, the only place I can kind of point you to that is a good um, example, a hardcore example of how this has played out in an Indian law case with the current bench is this Washington State Department of Licensing versus Cougar Den case. I'm sure that um, a lot of you have already heard about this case or seen this case, but fundamentally there is a treaty right at issue in this case. And if you'll look with me at the slide, the treaty language that's in question says, if necessary for public convenience, roads may be run through the reservation, and on the other hand, the right of way with free access from the same to the nearest public highway is secured to the tribe, and also uh, the right in common with citizens of the United States to travel upon the public highway. So what happened in this instance was Cougar Den is a corporation that's owned by a member of the Yakima Nation. And the corporation entered into a contract with a trucking company to transport fuel from Oregon onto the Yakima Reservation. And the, the fuel was sold to gas stations on the reservation. And the state of Washington said, we are going to tax your bringing that fuel in. And they tried to, to um, assert a $3.6 million tax liability against this corporation. Of course, the corporation comes back and says, this treaty gives us the right to travel, and you shouldn't be taxing our travel. And the state came back and said, we're not taxing your travel, we're taxing your possession of motor fuels, right? So this went back and forth and ends up um, at the Supreme Court because ultimately um, the Supreme Court had to determine whether or not the tax should be allowed. So the Supreme Court agrees with the Supreme Court of the state of Washington that the tax cannot be imposed. Um, the Supreme Court says that the treaty preempts the tax that the treaty protects uh, the tribe's right to travel on a public highway, even if they have goods in tow with them, that the tax um, was not on the possession of the fuel, the tax was in fact on travel and should not have been assessed since there's a travel protection in the treaty. Um, and the court you know, actually uses those Indian canons of construction that we have all learned and, and still use to this day to make sure that ambiguities are going to be resolved in favor of tribes. Now, this is the part where I get a little bit excited, and maybe I shouldn't. I want to point out some language from a concurring opinion that Gorsuch authored and that Ginsburg signed on to. And I want to point this out because it's kind of our first Indian law case where Gorsuch is sounding off on an issue in a Supreme Court opinion to give us an idea of where his leading may be when we're talking about issues that impact uh, tribal governments and tribal people. <laughs> So um, the slide has a quote, I'm going to read it to you in case you can't see it. This is a quote from um, Neil Gorsuch's concurring opinion. As the state reads the treaty, it promises tribal members only the right to venture out of the reservation and use the public highways like everyone else. But the record shows that the consideration the Yakima supplied was worth far more than an abject promise they would not be made prisoners on the reservation. In fact, the millions of acres the tribe ceded were a prize the United States desperately wanted. The Yakimas knew all of this and could see the writing on the wall. One way or another, their land would be taken. If they managed to extract from the negotiations the simple right to take their goods freely to and from market on the public highways, it was a price the United States was more than willing to pay. By any fair measure, it was a bargain basement deal. 
And my very favorite line, my very favorite line from this concurring opinion, the state is now dissatisfied with the consequences of one of those promises. It is a new day, and now it wants more. But today, and to its credit, the court holds the parties to the terms of their deal. It is the least we can do. I just think that's so powerful and so cool, because I'm sorry, this may not seem like anything to be excited about, but when you read Supreme Court cases in Indian law for the last several decades, there's been nothing this strong and this protective, right, um, language coming out that's just really, really excellent language, I think. Um, again, um, not everything can be sunshine and roses. The dissents, nothing new, nothing that we wouldn't expect. Um, we've got Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Thomas saying that wasn't a tax on travel, that was a tax on possession. And then Kavanaugh and Thomas again um, further dissenting to talk about um, kind of how the bargain worked out in the treaty. So nothing, nothing of that's really surprising there, but at least this case gives us kind of a flavor or an inkling as to how the court's, um, the court's doctrine may shift with this new addition to the Supreme Court. Does anybody have any comments about that or questions? Anyone think I'm completely crazy and off base and I need to get a life? Okay, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna move on, okay. Couple of things um, before we leave talking about the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court denied cert in a few cases, which um, I highlight these cases because in these cases, the lower court's decisions um, will stand and result in wins for the tribes. So the Supreme Court denied cert um, in cases involving Osage Nation, which was a wind farm case, uh, North Fork Rancheria, um, that was a tribal trust lands case where the tribe was um, successful, um, and also the Ute tribe, that was a tribal court exhaustion doctrine, and the Supreme Court denied cert in those cases between the lower court um, decision stand, and those are all wins for the tribe. I'll tell you there are several um, cert petitions pending in front of the Supreme Court. Not sure if they're going to pick them up. Not sure if they're going to deny them. Um, but there are about 13 of those pending right now that haven't been decided. Um, one in particular, one of interest uh, to Oklahoma in particular, is there's a Comanche Nation of Oklahoma case um, related to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act and after acquired lands for the Comanche Nation. Um, but there are just a handful of different types of issues um, pending uh, cert uh, petition in the Supreme Court. Okay, let's go ahead and talk just really quickly about some of the federal appellate court decisions um, that have been interesting over, I'd say, the last uh, several months. We're going to start with the Ninth Circuit. Um, we law professors kind of like to make, out, make fun of the Ninth Circuit sometimes, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to tell you, you know, what the cases say and how they work out. Um, so we've got, you know, four here um, listed that are Ninth Circuit cases, that are Indian law cases. I'll tell you briefly about each one of them. <coughs> And that first case, Cooley, involved a Crow tribal police officer who stopped a non-Indian person on a right-of-way on the reservation. And when the officer stopped the individual, the officer um, walked up to the person's window, the person rolled um, his window down. And the officer um, was, was visiting with the person and ultimately decided that the person um, needed to be arrested and that the person's car needed to be searched. So when um, the tribal police officer went forward with that search of the automobile, there were a whole lot of drugs found inside of the automobile. So ultimately, um, this individual was charged with federal drug violations, including possession of methamphetamine and also intent to distribute methamphetamine. So obviously, um, the defendant challenged the tribal officer's authority to search his automobile. And what we had in this instance was the court finding that the tribal officer acted outside the scope of his authority. And the way that the court kind of set forth what the rule is for purposes of an officer walking up to a person parked on a right-of-way and interrogating him, the rule is the officer has the authority to make a determination when walking up to the window as to whether the person is an American Indian person or not. And what's interesting in this case is that it seems that the officer, by looking at the individual, made the assessment that the person was not American Indian. Um, that might work in this particular tribal community, right? But it doesn't work in Oklahoma, so that kind of blew my mind that it was just an assessment walking up to a window and going, that person's not a native person. But in any event, that's how it played out in this case. So the court um, sets forth kind of the general rule that a tribal officer has limited authority when it relates to non-Indians and um, 
when a tribal officer is trying to determine if a person is Indian, if that officer thinks it's apparent that state or federal law has been broken, then the officer can proceed to the next step um, with an investigation or an arrest. But in this particular instance, the court found that this officer's exercise of authority was outside the scope of his authority and um, you know, said, that, said that the officer was in the wrong on that one. Second case, the Knighton case, that was a non-member employee of a tribe who left employment and the tribe sued that employee in tribal court. Um, the Ninth Circuit determined that the tribe had the authority to do all of the things the tribe was seeking to do as to this non-member. Number one, because they tied it back to the tribe's exclusion, uh, exclusion authority, but also in the Ninth Circuit case, the court found that the non-member's conduct threatened the political integrity, economic security, or health and welfare of the tribe. Um, that's a test from a case uh, that's called Montana. We law professors really despise Montana and hope the Supreme Court would clean it up, but they haven't yet. So in this instance, I think it's kind of an interesting case because you got the Ninth Circuit finding that the second Montana exception has been met, and they never find that, so it's just kind of a fun case. Um, okay, the next case, Newsom. This dealt with a tribal state gaming compact where the tribe contested a provision of the compact related to termination and extension, and the Ninth Circuit determined that it were allowed for that provision, so the tribe was not successful in the challenge. And then the last case, the Franks Landing case, this was a case where we had a tribe that was not a federally recognized American Indian tribe um, trying to start a gaming enterprise and uh, submitted an ordinance to the National Indian Gaming Commission. Uh, NIGC denied that the tribe had any right to conduct gaming activities and uh, the Ninth Circuit agreed that that was in fact the case that um, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act is very clear that you have to be a federally recognized tribe to engage in gaming operations. Okay, let's move on to the Fifth Circuit. Um, the Fifth Circuit, there are a couple of cases um, that are somewhat interesting from an Indian law perspective. Um, first, we've got this Texas versus Alabama Cushada Tribe of Texas. Um, here we have the Alabama Cushada Tribe of Texas trying to conduct gaming. Um, they were enjoined from doing so in a, an injunction that was imposed in 2003. Um, but the tribe was trying to vacate that old injunction and go ahead and uh, start offering some gaming um, on, on its tribal territory. Um, the federal district court denied um, revocation of that injunction in the Fifth Circuit affirm, saying that Texas law, not the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, governs here. So um, that, that may very well be going up. The last one that I'll mention from the Fifth Circuit is the Indian Child Welfare case. You guys, if you get your news off the Facebook, you probably saw it just like I did, but there were a whole lot of articles that blew up about this case, right? We have this federal um, district court judge saying that the Indian Child Welfare Act is unconstitutional because, this federal district court judge said, the Indian Child Welfare Act is based on a race distinction, right? Those of us who practice in Indian law for a long time are well aware that that is just not how the doctrine has been developed, that we're not dealing with a racial classification, we're dealing with this political classification stuff, and so we shouldn't be um, relitigating this feud over and over and over again, but here we are yet again, um, kind of protecting against intrusion onto the Indian Child Welfare Act based on these race-based classifications. Um, I'll tell you that in that case, um, the, the invalidation of the Indian Child Welfare Act was stayed, thank goodness, and um, oral arguments were actually presented to the Fifth Circuit in March. Again, you can read the tea leaves by going back and looking at that transcript of the oral arguments, but I'll tell you, a three-judge panel heard the arguments. Uh, one of the judges, uh, Priscilla Owens, said, and I quote, you use the word your children, talking to counsel who would seek to invalidate it, quote. You use the words your children, they are not your children, they are the children of the tribe. So at least that judge seems to have some understanding of it and what it's, what it's there for. Okay, so quickly I'll mention just a few lower federal court cases. There are a whole lot, okay, there are a whole lot of those that are just, you never know what you're gonna get, right? They ebb and flow from year to year. Um, but I can kind of put them into a few different categories in looking at all of those different types of cases that are pending in the federal courts um, across the United States. Obviously, lots of conversation, as there always is, about Montana. We've got um, lower federal courts trying to figure out how to apply the Montana Doctrine, which is a big Indian law doctrine about um, jurisdiction over non-members. Um, like I say, they don't all get it right all the time, but they're trying, and again, it's a, it's a mess that we kind of wish the Supreme Court would clean up at some point. Um, quite a few issues related to criminal prosecutions by tribal governments. 
Um, quite a few issues related to off-reservation claims of sovereign immunity. Tribes engaged in off-reservation activity and still um, invoking sovereign immunity as a defense. Um, we see quite a few choice of law and contracts issues in these federal court cases, um, and, and I, I don't think this will surprise anybody. Quite a few medical cannabis and cannabis cases um, related to American Indian tribes and development of cannabis businesses. Um, and then finally, kind of that last group that I would say was pretty prevalent in those um, lower federal court filings is uh, cases related to Aboriginal title and reservation status. Okay, so that was a whole lot of information. Um, we have a few minutes before we're scheduled to take a break before the next presenter. I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Okay, thank you very much.